What is it about classics that keeps them in our hearts and our minds year after year, decade after decade, century after century? Heavens, some have been around for millennia. Yet as readers, we're also driven by the desire for the new, the story we haven't read yet, the author nobody else has heard about, the book we haven't found yet. And it's these dueling driving forces that keep us voraciously reading. Hi, I'm Leah and welcome to Hide and Seek and welcome to my classic and contemporary book pairing tag. Now it's kindly tagged by the creator herself, Jennifer from Insert Literary Pun here everybody's favourite smart girl. Please tell me I'm not the only one who feels intellectually insignificant every time she posts a video. I'd also like to really shout out Al from Big Al Books. I will put her video link up here and down below as well. Al always brings books I've never heard of and she speaks so articulately and insightful about them that they all go straight to my TBR. But here are my options for the classic and contemporary book tag. Now last year I had a rather unconscious classic and contemporary book pairing when I was rattling around on my shelves at home and found Cry the Beloved Country by Alan Payton written in 1948 at the start of the apartheid movement in South Africa. Now this was one of Oprah's book club's initial picks years and years ago and it has been made into a oh, surprisingly good movie of the same name with James Earl Jones as one of the key characters. And it tells of that fractious changing structural political upheaval that affected South Africa at the time and the start of the apartheid movement. It weaves a heart-wrenching story but one that has hope through it. Whilst written by a white man, the Afrikaans and the black people as well have their story told, I believe, in a respectful and insightful way. And I feel it does an excellent job to paint all the points of view of the start of the apartheid movement. Now, the following month last year, I think it was July, I picked up Born a Crime by Trevor Noah, an autobiographical story he writes of being born a crime to a black mother and a white father. And this story was told at the end of the apartheid movement and it's wonderful to compare the two stories and how the aims of apartheid, the reason it was formed in the first place, never reached their ultimate goal at the end of apartheid and that sweeping history from the start to the end, whilst told in completely different ways, was a really good way to get an understanding of the whole apartheid time frame. And I just found it to be very, very insightful. I strongly urge you to go and look for Cry the Beloved Country. Definitely underread and unheard of, but a book definitely worth your time. And of course, everybody's favorite booktube biography at the moment going around definitely would be Trevor Noah and worth your time and energy to read that book as well. Now I don't have the next coupling, the next pair of books, but hear me out on this one. Vanity Fair by William Thackeray and Crazy Rich Asians by Kevin Kwan. Now, <laughs> Vanity Fair tells of a slice of life, the opulent Victorian life, for a reader who was looking in from the outside. The story, the book was written for an audience who wasn't part of that culture. And it contained all the tidbits, all the racy stories of the time. There was the virtuous woman, the fallen woman, the social climber, and all the different social structures. And it was written for an audience who was looking lovingly at these rich people thinking how perfect their life is and would be. And couple that with Crazy Rich Asians, again written for an audience external to the people they're writing about and people looking into that wondrous rich Singaporean lifestyle. And again all the archetypes of the social climbers, the virtuous woman, the, the stately grandmother and all these different stereotypes were in there. Now you could argue that Thackeray is classic and highbrow, but at the time it was just a rollicking good story written for the masses and written to be enjoyed, just like Crazy Rich Asians. And I'm wondering 
whether in the future crazy rich Asians will stand that test of time. Now interestingly, another book that sort of fits in the middle there would be Bonfires of the Vanities, much more of an homage to Vanity Fair, even the name you know, reflects that. So Tom Wolfe written in the 1980s. I think at this point in time it needs to marinate for another 20 or 30 years before it actually reaches that classic status. But I think it could because again it's telling a story for people looking into that excessive lifestyle of New York in the 1980s and were wanting and wondering how wonderful it could be written for the masses and written for an enjoyment and a satire on all those different points of time. So I think that's a really good coupling there. The third pairing I'd like to talk about, Goodreads led me to this pairing. The Choke by Sophie Laguna is the modern book and coupled when it came up in my Goodreads it says oh you finished reading The Choke, read The Tenant of Wild Failed Hall by Anne Bronte and I'm going The Choke written by Sophie Laguna an Australian author tells the story of family abuse, tells the story of a girl who has been constrained by her family and has been not abused physically but abused through lack of exposure to the outside world, lack of exposure to education, lack of exposure to love and how that affects her life and how she eventually seeks solace outside and tries to escape her family yet they keep drawing back and people are wondering where she's coming from. So digging deeper, I have not read The Tenet of Wildfeld Hall. Claudia, I think you and I are doing this together. Claudia from Spinster's Library, I'm going to put her channel down below. And again, tells the story of a woman escaping an abusive family situation, an abusive relationship and trying to discover her life outside of that situation. So whilst I haven't read this, the choke was confronting. It tells a strangely feminist story of a suppressed young girl and her desire to escape that freedom. And I think this is how it couples nicely with The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. And thanks to Goodread for highlighting it because I would never, ever have thought of that at all. Following on from that, another Australian story. Now I'm going to go with the modern one first again. Becoming Curly Lewis by Jane Har Harrison. Now Jane Harrison is an Aboriginal woman and this is a story of a young girl adopted in a loving adoption into a white family and how she goes on and discovers herself yet also goes on to discover her birth family and the riches with which that comes from. That comes with that. I'm tripping over my words. And that couples strangely with Jane Eyre. Now Jane is an orphan, she is adopted into a family and she has these terrible struggles and hardships. So yes this is a long bow but the discovery at the end where Jane finds her family and finds the riches financial but also the riches of life that go along with it and her self-discovery that there is more to her life than being an insular and isolated young woman and that marries nicely with the themes here in Becoming Kiralee Lewis. Now Kiralee goes off to university after living in this sheltered lifestyle and she does come across her birth family, her Aboriginal birth family and the discoveries with which that comes and the riches not in financial or physical riches but the riches of cultural identity and the riches of expansion of her life and the opportunities with which it becomes. Yes this is a long bow. Now my only criticism of this book is that it's a YA book and I'm not saying that because YA books are bad I just think this is a fantastic story and could have benefited from being just grittier and holding more of a story but the parallels between Jane Eyre and Becoming Curly Lewis are there and I like the fact that a lost girl finds something with her family but it's not what she thinks it is and I definitely think it's a really good and interesting pairing. Now this year Sean the Book Maniac and I and Robert from Barter Hordes and I have done buddy reads for La Spark or Madame Spark, The Wonder, The Only Muriel Spark and 
I'm so on the Muriel Spark bandwagon. Now, the driver's seat was the first one, first Muriel Spark I read, and I did this with Sean, the book maniac. And here I had just finished reading Eleanor Oliphant. Now, Muriel Spark, the driver's seat, is a modern classic telling the story of this rather itchy, scratchy, cantankerous woman. And as I said, I just finished reading Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine, a scratchy, itchy, cantankerous woman. Now, I didn't love Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. I loved this. Now this is a much tighter novel. The language is tighter and taut. The story is compacted into a hundred-ish pages, whereas Eleanor Oliphant dragged on a little bit more. But I loved how Lisa in this instance and Eleanor in Eleanor Oliphant are both unapologetically cranky, prickly women. We never get a resolution as to why Lisa is this way in Muriel Spark like we do with Eleanor Oliphant. I think that's perhaps the strength here. You're left to your own imagination as to why Lisa is like that. However, I don't think it diminishes the fact that sometimes you just want to read a story about such a fascinating, quirky character. And please consider reading Muriel Spark if you did and if you didn't like Eleanor Oliphant, because this is a great story of a similar character through into there. Now, the second pairing of Muriel Spark, The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie, and I did speak about this pairing as well in my Buddy Read vlog that I did with Robert from Barter Hordes. There's an incident in this book here where the students of Miss Jean Brodie witness an event that they misconstrue. They misunderstand the meanings behind this particular event. And I'm not going to go into spoilers because everybody hates a spoiler. And I find that that mirrors quite nicely a pivotal moment here in Atonement by Ian McEwan, where the whole premise of the book is that misconceived moment in time where a young person who doesn't have the ability to filter what they're seeing just sees a snapshot and goes, that's what I saw. And that pivots the whole book here. I loved this book and I found it's to just be how that pivotal moment shaped a whole family through into there. Whilst the pivotal moment in Miss Jean Brodie wasn't as pivotal to the story, but again, we're looking at 400-ish pages compared to 100-ish pages, this misconceived point in time and how it impacts a number of people is a matching pair through into here. So if you like short, sharp stories and you liked Atonement, consider Miss Jean Brodie, if nothing for the wit of the language of Muriel Spark, but just read it because it is a fascinating insight because we've all done that. We've all looked at something, someone, some period, some point in time and made our preconceived notions. Then to learn through maturity or experience or just a completely different point of view that we were wrong. And I found that both these books highlighted that and spoke to that really quite well. And finally, yes, finally, I'm going to talk about Persephone books. Now, Persephone books are beautiful and they bring wonderful, wonderful stories of forgotten classics and stories that we do and should read more frequently. These are not big fancy classics that have stood the test of times. These are small stories, stories that need to be preserved and need to be kept. And the only reason I'm raising Persephone books is because here in Australia, we have something similar, text classics. Now, they don't just do women writers like Persephone books do, but they preserve stories similar to Persephone books. This one here, The Die House by Mina Calthorpe, written in the 30s. And here I have Elizabeth Harrower, The Watchtower, written I think in the 50s or 60s. And they're very Australian stories, but by authors who have been not forgotten, but perhaps left on the shelf a little bit longer. So if you're looking for similar stories to Persephone books, but from an Australian point of view, please consider text classics. Now they're beautiful yellow sp spine editions, which sit nicely on the shelf when you couple them with vintage classic editions. And so, yes, they do look lovely on a bookshelf, but very similar and they do keep 
those stories alive. And we do need to keep these classic stories alive, the ones that go under the radar. So there is my classic and contemporary book pairings. Not as many as Al and not as many as some of the others I've heard, but they're the ones I could think of at the moment. And I do find this really interesting because it is my sweet spot for reading. I do like to mix a classic with many, many a contemporary story. What are some of your pairings? Now, I'm going to think of some people to tag and I'll link you all down below, but off the top of my head, I can't do it. But thank you for watching. Have a great day.